Hello and welcome to our online service of worship for Sunday, September 18th, 2022. I'm Reverend Matthew Freshly, and on behalf of the First Presbyterian Church, thank you for taking this time to worship God. We pray that the service will be a blessing to you and bring glory to God. As you are able, I invite you to join me in our call to worship. It is taken from Psalm 113 and will be read responsively. Praise the Lord! Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. join me in our litany of confession. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. We are here to worship God, but we are also in need of healing from our fatal sin condition. May we confess this openly to God, who redeems broken, penitent people. Holy God, too often we choose our way over your way, and we are slow to listen. We have done inexcusable things. We have not treated other people with true charity and respect. We think about ourselves too much, either to condemn ourselves or to justify ourselves. You are the only righteous judge. We stand before you guilty, yet trusting in Jesus' grace to make us new again. Please take a moment of silence to confess your sins to God. Blessed are we, church, for even though on our own we are spiritually bankrupt, the kingdom of God is always near. So believe God and believe that Jesus has forgiven us completely. He is ever-present to guide and empower us. Amen. That's the truth. Yes, God, yes.
Today's affirmation of faith is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. Christ Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Before we hear the scriptures read and preached today, let's pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you. God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our first reading is from the Old Testament book of Amos, chapter 8, verses 4 through 7. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the epath smaller and the shekel heavier and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of their deeds. The Gospel reading for this Sunday is from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Then Jesus said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do, now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, make it fifty. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager, because he had acted shrewdly, for the children of this age are more shrewd in their dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If, then, you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> My best friend in second grade, Jason, and I used to have some fun trading coins with his younger brother, Jeremy, who didn't yet understand the value of money and thought only in terms of more is better. So we took advantage of our superior knowledge and we would offer him trades like this. Hey, we'll give you 10 of our nickels for only four of your quarters. Or we'll give you 20 of these shiny pennies for just one 
of those old ratty dollar bills you have. Poor Jeremy thought he was getting a good deal, while in reality he was getting fleeced by a couple of grade school jerks. Jason and I were being shrewd in what the Bible clearly condemns as the wrong way, valuing monetary advantage over being in honest and right relationships with others. The prophet Amos, full of God's spirit, spoke strongly against the dishonest practices and systems that Israel had put in place, which kept the rich getting richer and the poor being treated like slaves. Today's Old Testament reading has harsh words for business operators who resent employee benefits and who figure out ways to sell less and less product for more and more profit. Ultimately, the greater problem isn't even the unequal distribution of wealth, although that's a serious problem, but it's the devaluing of people. How can you sell scraps to those whom God loves? How can you treat as a slave a person who has been made in the very image of God? Do you not understand what God values? Is more money really a good deal, or are you actually being spiritually fleeced when you trade away so much of your soul for the shiny material things that you think are of greater value? In our New Testament reading for today, Jesus wishes that his people would be as shrewd about spiritual matters, about what God values, as the scoundrels are shrewd about making money. It's not that Jesus condones the unethical behaviors of that dishonest manager in his story, but rather Jesus holds up the wisdom that that scoundrel demonstrated in trading what he was soon going to lose for the sake of future benefits. The manager, upon getting fired, realized that his current gravy train was finished and that money was not going to help him in the future as much as friends. So what is Jesus teaching us? What is the Holy Spirit saying to us through these scriptures today? Well, as always, Jesus is speaking the truth. What we have now on earth in the body is like that dishonest wealth which cannot ultimately be trusted. Start trading it in now in order to build a foundation on God who will be there for us long after our bodies and our stuff fails us. This is wisdom for all who believe that God is the ultimate reality and God's promises can really be trusted. It's only reckless advice for the cynical unbeliever that thinks that this physical world as it is now is really all that you get. You know, just get as much stuff as you can before you die and return to nothing. But if we truly believe that undergirding all of the seen and visible and tangible reality is an ultimate spiritual reality, then we need to start making intentional trades here on earth while we can, trading in what is temporary for what will last forever. Just like that shrewd manager in the story did, start trading what he had, which was you know, his master's money for friendships that would last beyond the job ending. We should ask ourselves, what is 90 or 100 years of physical life on earth compared to the reality of a spiritual eternity? Even the ancient Egyptians recognized that we're going to be dead for a lot longer than we were alive in the body, in just this world. And I know from personal experience, it's not easy to make those trades because we do live in this immediate reality. We live under what some call the tyranny of the urgent, you know, the physical, the practical, and, and we need to be wise about practical matters and about tangible matters in the here and now, but we can't live as if the here and now is all that there is. We've been taught to trust only in what we can touch and see and feel and to think of the spiritual realm as something that's 
unreal and less tangible and is it and is it really even there but in truth everything that we see is but an expression of deeper spiritual realities everything owes its very existence to god who is spirit and never needed a body but created all bodies and all materials Jesus' teaching today ends with some profound truisms. And it speaks to that living for only worldly matters or living with God's values in mind. Jesus says, if we, we can't even be trusted to live according to God's way with the little that we have, then how would we expect God to give us more? This is not said to shame us but simply to wake us up to what we're doing or what we're not doing now. Jesus also reminds us that one day our ultimate loyalty will be revealed of what we really staked our soul upon. Who or what have we trained ourselves to respond to with a yes? And who or what have we trained ourselves to respond to with a no while we're living here? What habits are we forming? You know the old song, Cats in the Cradle, by Harry Chapin. Maybe some of you have heard that. Spoiler alert in case you're too young or you haven't heard that song. The father unintentionally trained his boy to say yes to work and no to time with his family. And the son learned the lesson. We are left to wonder, in the end, if the trade was worth it. Those that get teary-eyed at the end of the song would probably, presumably, tell us that this was ultimately a foolish trade, that the relationship should have been invested in more. My son loves video games, and I, too, have gotten caught up in virtual realities. My son likes Minecraft. I used to play a game called The Sims. It took up a lot of hours of my life, but both games can tempt us to spend a lot of time in an unreal world, right? And I wonder, as I think about that, the, you know, the contrast between a video game reality and, and our reality, it's like comparing that to our reality and, and the even greater reality that is the spiritual realm. So if you're playing video games, would anybody really occupy themselves in putting out a fire in their virtual world, like if my little sim house were on fire on the computer, if my actual home were on fire? Would anyone try to save their avatar from a creeper if there were a real burglar in their house at the same moment. And in a way, that's how we ought to be thinking about the merely physical and monetary realities around us, kind of like a virtual world that only matters in as much as it affects the real players who exist in the spiritual realm. The game is going to be unplugged. What awaits for us after? when we're no longer playing by the rules of this worldly video game, but we're in the kingdom of God. Jesus is our ambassador from the real world. For us believers, that's how we look at Jesus. He's, Jesus is the ambassador from the real world, showing us what God is like and telling us like it, it really is. Shall we be learning to live in Jesus' world forever or only in our temporary world? Let's value what Jesus values, namely a strong, loving relationship with God and true charity and kinship towards all souls around us who are living right now in the body, including our own spirits, which are in our bodies. Let's look for those practices that will keep us grounded in heaven and not trading what is really valuable for the monopoly money that this world plays with but only while the box is open. Let's do that, friends. Let's listen to Jesus. Let's bind to Christ's values. Amen. Church, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and bring you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Do not be afraid. Go and tell this good news to all. Thanks be to God.